the first thing we're going to do is introduce our speakers. Our speakers will get 90 seconds each to introduce themselves. After that, we'll move to questions from our student panel. Uh, they'll each get uh, one question each. The first part of our uh, debate tonight will take about 20 minutes to 25 minutes. At that point, we're going to throw it over to the public, and you folks will have your chance to ask the panelists some questions. So let's go. Uh, start off with, uh, I was going to say Professor Lindu, but it's Mayor Lindu these days. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mayor John Lindu from the city of Chester, and I'm here tonight for a couple of reasons. One is because every day, certain few Americans get killed uh, with handguns. Uh, and over the course of the year, we lose about 22, 23 uh, citizens as a result of handguns. Um, I know there's a lot of legislation, a lot of talk about handguns, and we're trying to solve the problem. And I'm here hoping to be additive to the problem solution. Uh, besides taking a position, a strong position, on how uh, the mayors against illegal guns can protect their citizens and, and live up to the mandate that they were elected to do. So I'm hoping to share some information that will be helpful uh, with that collective mission.
then it's our duty to support him and work as hard as we can for the enactment.
handguns, uh, concealed handguns, larger guns I carry. Uh, I don't see a, I don't see a reason to limit the, the number of handguns anybody or uh, firearms that the person can have. I also don't see the presence of firearms as being uh, the problem of violence. Uh, violence is a problem of its own. Um, often, when guns are removed from the equation, violence increases. You see that in different areas. Uh, yeah, without, yeah, we, um, the reducing, the increasing guns, uh, concealed carry permits is, is half crime in different areas of the country. So that's a fact. More guns, less crime, and uh, that's the way it is. And you'll find it lower gun ownership in different areas with a high rate of violence, uh, rape, murder, beat, people are beaten. Those kinds of crimes go up. We've seen it in different countries, different states. <coughs>
urban areas and rural areas. It's a misnomer to believe that it does. Uh, it's, a, it's a mistake to believe that it's just located in urban areas. Um, so I, I think it's, it probably does make sense to just declare guns illegal in a certain area. The important point is to keep the guns from getting there. And that's why guns, reducing gun trafficking is so important. That's why something like, like one handgun a month makes, makes sense. That's why it means to get gun dealers to, so that they will not sell the straw buyers makes sense. Often this issue is looked at only from the perspective of keeping hands and guns out of the hands of criminals in high crime areas. But there are people who have to live there and hopefully survive. Uh, if they are completely uh, un and disarmed, uh, they are going to be victims available to anybody who comes through their door. And this is not a good thing. This does not, I don't advocate in any way, shape, or form that everybody has, has guns. But if you picture a woman who's maybe 70, 80 years old living in a high crime area, how else is she going to defend herself from somebody breaking down the door and attacking? I, I frankly don't know if I have a way. Our final question will come from Hallie. Hallie, if you can speak to me. The Second Amendment protects our right to bear arms. Do you believe prohibiting individuals from owning automatic weapons, tanks, anti-aircraft weapons, nuclear weapons, etc. is an infringement on that right? Where should the line be drawn? So we'll start with Tom. Tom, where should the line be drawn? Well, you may not be familiar with the 1934 Gun Control Act, which totally bans the private ownership of machine guns or anything of that, or sawed-off shotguns, that limits any shotgun with a barrel length of less than 18 inches, any rifle with a barrel length of less than 16 inches, any gun with an overall length of less than 26 inches, is under the, under the 1934 uh, Act. And you are forbidden to own one unless you pay a $200 transfer tax to the federal government. You would be investigated, fingerprinted, and so forth by the FBI. Uh, so these guns are not legally even out there. The guns we're talking about that, that uh, President Obama and everybody else is talking about is semi-automatics. The difference being a full automatic, if you pull the trigger, you can literally empty the entire contents of the magazine in one burst. In a semi-automatic, you have to pull the trigger each time you fire a shot. There's a fundamental difference there. Semi-automatics are legal at this time. Full automatics are not, and I can't imagine anybody advocating any of the other things that you've mentioned, having citizens with the right to, to own them, because there, there's no justification whatsoever. Actually, you can own uh, fully automatic weapons. Um, you do have to go through a number of things to get one, but you can. And there was a seven-year-old killed in Connecticut because he went to a show where they were a firing range where they were letting people fire off machine guns. And his father said, here, you take a shot. And he pulled the trigger, and it had, he couldn't hold it, and it pointed right up and killed him. So yes, you can. So there's a lot of facts being thrown around here that maybe aren't facts. Where I think the Second Amendment lies is where the Supreme Court says it lies. It's as simple as that. And arguing over what I believe or what you believe is a waste of time. The second Supreme Court has said that there is an individual right to possess a handgun in the home for self-defense. That's all. And it also said that there are a number of laws and regulations that have been passed by states and other authorities that are presumptively legal including things like limitations on the number of guns that you can purchase, uh, requirements that you can't purchase certain guns, and so on and so forth. That's the law of the land, and that's what we have, I have to live with. Yeah. Um, the question was about where we should draw the line and, and, uh, on 
weaponry, military type weaponry. And I, I think the line gets drawn on what you can safely store without risking a, a catastrophe. I think we need to take a look back. You know, we praise our founders for uh, delivering, standing, writing the Declaration of Independence, standing against the King of England, freeing us from, uh, you know, its tyrannical reign of England, and delivering us a, a constitution and, and a promise of liberty. Um, when you look back to the Anti-Federalist Paper Number Ten, they were they expressed concern about how. Okay. Speak into the mic. When when you look back at the uh, Anti-Federalist Paper Number Ten, that, that was written and that, that people that were concerned about the federal government, they they expressed a concern basically that we would continue to fund this federal government while an amassing army against. James Madison responded in the Federalist Paper number 46 <laughs> and basically tried to quell that concern, saying that the, the most, uh, roughly, I don't want to read all this, but roughly he was saying that uh, the most they could get is uh, one, one hundred an army uh, of the, c c the society, one hundred, uh, one one hundred. So there'd be 99 of us citizens against the army. He was looking at an equally armed <coughs> army. Now what's going on is we're being reduced down to pea shooters. Uh, you know, they want to reduce it down to BB guns or, or, or less. While our military arms up. 50 calibers, full, full auto, they have it all. So we, we are losing our quality. And I know we're comfortable with the government that we have, but if you look at history, governments come and go. So I don't think we should get all that comfortable with what we have. <laughs> The, the question it, uh, centers around uh, the time and the framework of the Second Amendment. And, and I think the Second Amendment was put in place because it was necessary at that time to put it in place to raise an army and people to possess those weapons. We, we, don't, we have a different infrastructure now in the 21st century. And, and, and I think that at this particular time, and I'm, I'm not uh, saying that, again, to take the rights away. But over the course of America, we've adjusted to and adopted uh, those amendments and those uh, laws that have made it possible for us to get here today and buy 100 guns. And I'm just saying, I think that at this particular juncture, uh, we have to look at the problem and see what the problem is and make the proper adjustments. We don't want to uh, tamper with the Second Amendment if we don't have to tamper with the Second Amendment. I think. The basic thing we want to do is get gun checks uh, in, in America for everybody. We want to uh, uh, close the loops, the gun hole loops that, that exist, and we've done that here at least uh, in Pennsylvania uh, to some degree, and, 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 and minimize the potential for these heavy weapons of mass destruction to get on the street. And I just think we should go after sensible gun legislation. And I think we, we, we panic too fast to say something's going to be taken away from us when every day I look at these, and we, let's look at this. We, we talk about the Sandy Hook, 23, 26 people died Sandy Hook in one day. And we have 23, 20, 24 died in the course of a year. Trump is no different. And whether you get killed with AK-47, or 38, 357 Magnum, or 22, it's death is death, and the trauma is the same. So I'm saying with all of these Second Amendment experts, and probably most of them in America in this room tonight, we should be able to figure out and figure our way out of this and, and get responsible gun legislation that's going to accommodate everyone in here, whether you possess 100 guns or none at all. Thanks to the students of the participating tonight. A couple of minutes, so we'll take questions from the audience in a moment. Probably we'll be waiting for it. Before that, uh, we're going to do something we've been waiting for. And uh, my co founder, uh, Bob Small, and Roger Balsam, is back there, uh, are going to pass the buckets around for some contributions to pay for this event. And feel free to donate generously. Um, and then we'll line up and ask you questions.
normally when we ask a question, you can ask a question to any panel member. They all get a chance to answer it. Um, and then we move from there. I, I think I'll start by asking a few people in this side of the room uh, who would like to ask a question. Uh, could you raise your hand if you would? Um, let's take you, sir, you, sir, and you, ma'am. Would you come up to the microphone? Uh, then we'll move across the room. Uh, we have one hour. We'll try and accommodate as many questions as we can. Please, ask a question. Do not make a political statement. Uh, the folks up here will be making the political statement. Uh, you're asking the questions. So please, uh, a good and strong question. Uh, I was hoping for a little more clarification from Mr. John, Mr. Nelson, on Hallie's question about where do you draw the line. Um, I think we all agree that uh, we shouldn't have nuclear weapons in, uh, in, in individual civilian hands. Um, Mr. John, um, you said, I think if I, I try to write it down, uh, you draw the line of what you can safely store without, without uh, catastrophe, right? Risk and catastrophe. So would you have advocated Adam Lanza's mom um, have, get her guns taken away? <laughs> Because she didn't st safely store them, and a catastrophe ensued. Well, I, I don't know how she did. You know, I, I, I see. That, that's a tough question to answer. There, um, obviously, she had a troubled child, and you know, maybe, maybe she should have had a little. Can the guy answer the question? I, I don't know that she. Obviously, she didn't foresee that Adam was that great of a risk. I don't know what access he had to his firearm. Probably she he may have been entrusted with it. And, and she obviously didn't perceive that. So I, I don't know where we uh, I don't know what we better do for being uh reason planning right now. Anyone else want to answer that? I think you kinda answered Thank you. Um, my concern is um, the government is very concerned about our taking our guns away from us. But we have not gotten any result from Fast and Furious. And I want to know why everybody here isn't contacting our representatives and telling them we want to know what happened to those 2,000 guns that have been found in Chicago and other places in this country, and they still can't account for them. And also, Chicago has the highest crime rate in the country, and they have the strictest laws. So tonight I am asking all of you, what would you do to get our government to make us, to make us safer and get these guns, straw guns, guns like Fast and Furious, what would you do to help us keep safe? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I I've mentioned before, so the President has proposed four things uh, to, and seeking enactment of them. What I would do is I'd work to get those four things enacted. The assault weapons ban, a, ban, a limitation on uh, bullets, uh, excuse me, the capacity of ammunition magazines, um, uh, universal background checks, and measures to uh, to combat gun trafficking. There it is there. That's what I do. I think um, that we have to use what we have, if we can bring those issues of concern to the table, I represent mayors against illegal guns. And now we're at the capacity of about 900 mayors across the country in a bipartisan group. And we talk about urban and rural communities. Uh, it's a mixed bag of, of tricks. If, that's, if, if those are issues of, of accountability, I think is what uh, the lady's asking for. Uh, then, then those are some things that we are willing to look at 
as mayors to give to illegal guns. And, I, and what I'm saying to you, I don't have all 900 of them with me tonight, but that's certainly some of those issues uh, of concern we need to talk about and see what we can support if we can reciprocate that support and get support for some of the things that we want to bring uh, to the table and, and, and things that will help America be a safer place. So we all want that, and, and nobody feels the punch for that except, I shouldn't say except, like the mayors who have the cities to protect where their citizens are dying. We, we have to do something about that. You put us in office, and you give us that responsibility. The only thing we're saying is help help us, help meet us halfway with it. And certainly if that's a, a common interest and a strong interest, we, we certainly will be willing to listen to that, and I will certainly be willing to, to share that information and introduce that to the mayors and see if we can help. Thank you. I'm not sure that any of you really are, or most of you are familiar with Fast and Furious. 2,500 assault rifles were straw purchased and transported across the Mexican border with the BATFE overlooking the whole thing with the expectation that somehow once they were found at crime scenes, these guns would be uh, able, they'd enable them to find the, the real kingpins. Uh, unfortunately, one of our federal agents was murdered with one of these guns. No, no, no. Uh, That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Terry was murdered with one of these guns. There were two guns found at the scene where he was murdered. Uh, at this point, uh, Attorney General Holder has never apologized to the parents of this young man uh, for this. Uh, and these guns have been used to kill at least 200 Mexicans. I read a horror story of a group of teenagers who were partying that were like probably 30 or 40 of them that were all killed, and these weapons were found at the crime scene. Our Justice Department was responsible for those guns being trafficked across the border, and nobody has really called them to account for it. And there have been a few people shuffled around and wanted to uh, terminate it, but nothing major. Uh, this is a really serious thing. We're talking about assault weapons. This is 2,500 that went across the Mexican border with our Oversight. Uh, this is not a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's got to be right? So please ask a question. Sure. Well, number one, I do have a comment to make. Everybody's been making comments. 10,000 M16s went to Iraq. They did not need 10,000 M16s. Cold arms just wanted a piece of the profit. My question is to Mr. John. He referenced the Kent State incident with National Guards killing uh, uh, protesting youth, uh, college students. What I'm hearing a lot of here, and he, he didn't mention that, the fear of fear of the government so that you can have your guns. Young lady earlier asked about what kind of weapons. Well, I'm a gunman. A, a co-worker of mine said when I had a discussion with him, he'd like to be able to own the tank. And that's what it comes down to. You're never going to be able to match the government that you people are speaking out against. So the question is, why do you keep referencing the government? Why did you use the fact that the National Guard killed students? What, what was the purpose of that? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I think it's, we somehow think that uh, <coughs> our military would never turn on our citizens, but it has. Uh, you know, in Tiananmen Square, we saw uh, quite a few Chinese citizens killed in Tiananmen Square. And you have to ask the question, well, what, how can those people that were raised in that community turn on their own, their own neighbors, their own kind? We saw it here. Kent State, National Guard opened fire with like 67 shots in 13 seconds, four dead, nine wounded. After Katrina, we've seen the National Guard 
door to door, taking guns from citizens, leaving them unarmed to deal with looters that were running the streets. Um, it, it's not that our, I don't so much fear, our, the only reason I fear our government is because I fear it's headed towards collapse. You know, the citizen uprising is, is very real and possible. It, it, you know, we see it happen all over the world. I think we're deluding ourselves to think it can't happen here. We can reach a tipping point on any issue, and, and uh, we can have riots in the streets. We've seen them here in the 60s. We've seen them on other issues. Um, it's a real threat. The, the, the citizens are turning on us is a real threat. And we need to be prepared to deal with that. that that's what I'm saying. I don't think we have the government that's going to turn evil necessarily, but you never know. We've had two Supreme Court justices that predicted our government, our, our nation could fall into a dictatorship. Because what, the problems in our country face could be so severe that someone would step up and say, I'll solve your problems as long as you give me total control. Two Supreme Court justices have predicted that. What follows that? We don't know. Uh, we're going to take questions from this section of the room. Then. Uh, would you raise your hand, please?
So you're absolutely right on the background checks. I believe it was uh, 66,000. The, the system, the record system right now for uh, uh, that needs to be updated to these background background checks checks is not even in place properly. So I'm not I'm not so much on changing the Constitution as I am on trying to adopt the laws that exist so that we can get something enforced. We can't we can't uh, police people who have mental health problems if, who get through the system by a gun. And I'm not, uh, uh, I'm a, f a, a former psychology teacher, so believe me, my, my compassion is with anybody who has a particular issue at any given time. But there's some people who have problems who don't need to have a gun because they are not mentally capable of being responsible for that at the time. Once they do whatever they need to do to eradicate that situation, again, system needs to be updated so that those background, background checks are kept up to date. Uh, we've been having too many people fall through the cracks, end up getting the guns, and then we have a problem with it. So, so it, to say that there's, I think what I've been hearing, uh, not just here tonight, but across uh, the country and around the state in dealing with this issue is that there's absolutely no answer to it. I saw a sign that said, you know, uh, trying to do gun control is, is a myth or something that will always be a myth. Well. It's not a myth for me every day when I get up and I go out 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning and see those kids laying down on the street with their brains blown out. We have to do something because the problem is not going to stay inside of Chester. It, it, if 23 die in one day in Chester, I mean in Sandy Hook, and 23 die across the year in, in, uh, in, in Chester or some other urban city, three or 400, 500 in New York, 348 in Philadelphia. If that happens and keeps happening, where is the democracy and what's the use of having 100 guns if you can't help protect all of them? Let's go to the center of the room here at three things. Oh, you'd like to answer the shirt, Tom. During the National Rifle Association meeting with Vice President Joe Biden in the White House Gun Violence Task Force, the Vice President said the Obama administration does not have the time to fully enforce existing gun laws. In 2010, prosecutors considered just 22 cases of information falsification according to a 2012 report to the Department of Justice by the Regional Justice <coughs> Information Service. Forty additional background check cases ended up before prosecutors for reasons related to unlawful gun possession. And all prosecutors pursued just 44 of those 62 cases. More than 72,600 applications were denied on the basis of a background check. It is problematic when the administration takes lightly the prosecutions under existing gun laws and yet does not seem to have a problem promoting a whole host of other gun laws. Tyranny is an issue. I mean, when you're talking constitution, I know the answer to my question. You're talking about enemies, foreign and domestic. It's not just the outside enemy, but it's also domestic enemies. Sure. And it's the, the right to bear arms is related to that issue. And where do we draw the ethical line between the appropriate constitutional protection and the ends justifies the means ethic that has wreaked havoc in history?
protects my right as an individual citizen to protect myself from tyranny. How do, where, where do we draw this line? Anybody want to try that? Well, uh, for me, I don't want everybody in my city carrying a gun. I, I don't, I, yes, you're absolutely right. I don't want it, I, I was going to finish the statement. I don't want everybody in my city carrying a gun. Everybody is not going to be responsible for carrying a gun, nor do everybody want a gun in my city. And I don't think everyone in America wants to have a gun. But as you said, the fear of tyranny, I don't know where it went, the fear of tyranny, it, it, it is real, but, but in some circles it's, it's philosophical. And other, for me, it's real. And, and we have to find a way to merge and, and draw this line somewhere because it, it's, it, when these people are dying, it's not a philosophical discussion. And, and, and all I'm saying is that we got these bright minds in here and everybody knows everything else. The mayors against illegal guns need you and we hope you need us. We think we can help solve this problem. So that line has to be figured out. It's not where we draw the line, it's whether we want to draw a line and do something about it. Next question. I have a little bit of setup online just for the board of in, in, after the Helen McDonald cases, once Chicago had its handgun ban overturned, the city of Chicago quickly passed zoning laws and zoned public ranges out of the city because their new handgun law required so many hours of live fire training. A woman named Rhonda Zell wanted to open a gun range in the city and couldn't, so she had to sue. What happened was this case went to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals was using the precedence from a case that dealt with churches, where one church was in one jurisdiction and the town didn't want a church of that denomination built in their towns because you can practice your right elsewhere. What happened was the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals stated that in light of the Heller and McDonald cases, this circuit, as well as other federal circuits, have started to apply First Amendment doctrine to Second Amendment context. So since Brian keeps saying, you know, SCOTUS is saying this, and SCOTUS is saying that, how, where do you draw the line of First Amendment, Brian? Talk about guns, not to talk about sports. But if the federal courts are using First Amendment doctrine for Second Amendment I'm, I'm, no I'm no expert. Well, you keep voting still. So, the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah, yeah. The right up there. I agree with you. But tell me what you're doing. We're not having a good debate here. I don't know where to go. Thank you very much for coming out, everybody. I don't know about you guys, I, I can hardly sit through a two-hour debate without having to use a restroom, let alone go 13 hours doing a filibuster. That was phenomenal. But the context of that filibuster, I'm, I'm getting to it. I do have a mild setup. It's not enough. The context of that filibuster was whether or not the President of the United States has the authority to order the death of a United States citizen on U.S. soil without the benefit of a jury trial. Now my question to the panel, to whoever would be willing to answer, how are you able to reconcile an assault weapons or so-called assault weapons ban or restrictions on magazine capacities against the fact that those same restrictions would limit American citizens' final defense against the tyrannical government which might turn against its populace when we're having an argument about whether or not the United States government can destroy its own citizens without going through due process. things 
that I think can be regulated without any problem. And it seems to me that most Americans in every poll I look at say basically the same thing about 70 to 80 percent and 90 percent in some cases there's agreement between people in the NRA and the mayors against illegal guns and most Americans about background, background checks. Let's do that part. If we do that part, I think we can get a start. Um, there's, there's most agreement about safer schools. Let's do that part. And the answer to safer schools, incidentally, is not a cop in every school or, or cops in every school. There's more to it than that. There's education and understanding about, you know, guns and so forth. So we get that. There's, there's prevention curriculum that we can employ. And, and, and we can work with some people who are, uh, are gun enthusiasts in our way to help build that curriculum. But, but assault weapons are not the only thing at stake here. And I think the discussion has to move beyond taking someone's assault weapon if, rather than getting agreement with those people who are in the position to talk about that and, and, and help to, to reconcile it in some kind of way. So it's, it's not just hinting on assault weapons for me. Yeah, I, I'd like to just address a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think it's important nobody's mentioned it yet tonight, but uh, from 1990 to 2011, the violence rate is, is dropped in half. On this. So uh, we are going in the right direction. Uh, on the issue of magazines, uh, it, you never know how many rounds a person needs to defend themselves. Uh, let's look at uh, during the uh, riots, during after uh, Rodney King in LA, the Korean shop owners were on their rooftops trying to fight back the, uh, the mobs. And at the end of the day, their shops were still there, and they weren't dragged into the streets like many others and uh, beaten. In the course of that, it was Reginald Denny who wasn't so lucky. He uh, was driving a construction truck and just happened into the middle of the riot in the course of his, his job, and he was pulled out of the truck and beaten and fatally, uh, well, seriously injured uh, and never recovered fully from that, from that beating there. Uh, if he had a gun, uh, how many how many clip, you know, how many bullets would he needed in his magazine? Um, the military found many people, uh, their soldiers, uh, dead with empty clips in Korea, empty magazines. Uh, their guns were empty in Korea, and, uh, and they, they they were hit with machetes. And it was a result of that that the military realized they needed to increase the magazine capacity for our military. The same thing on our streets. It's important to remember we're first responders. When uh, when criminals do come out, the police are the last ones to get there. It's usually an armed citizen if we're lucky to, to face it. But why should it be any less harm than the police? Well, we keep moving here. We have about 30 minutes left. I feel like we need a good joke here, but uh, I'm not uh, striking out, so we're going to keep plowing ahead. Uh, I'm going to go section by section, we'll keep going. Uh, over to this section, the lady in the front, the gentleman in the center, and Robin in the back. For those who want to take away our guns, I remind them that we've had prohibition, we have laws against drugs. And how's that working out? Now obviously someone that bored it on that whatever here this panel <clears throat> not been watching the hearings going on about Fast and Furious. I will give my question. I want to know from the panel, why don't we talk about those that protect themselves with their arm with their guns? Like the woman that was in the closet with two kids that protected herself and her family. These are the type of people you want to take guns away from. And as one final, and I would like to know who in this board agrees with this, uh, women, it's been suggested that a woman, by Democrats, by the way, um, that when a woman is in, in danger of being raped, she should pee on herself. She should throw up. Uh, who in this board agrees with this? 
Well, we're from there. You might honor him having me that one first. So, we're all going to look at the kids. That was a shot. We're all going to do that. There was a very interesting incident that happened several years ago. A woman was up in years and her husband had died and left her as thumb nose 38. And one night when she was in bed, she heard a crash downstairs. And there were people breaking into the house. And she sat on the top step and she heard them say, we're going to finish off the old pitch and then we're going to clean out the house. And she knew that the fourth step from the top creaked. She waited till she heard the creaking and she emptied the revolver down the stairs. She heard crashing, banging, and screaming. When the police arrived, they found one of the home invaders at the bottom of the stairs dead. Two blocks away, they found another one with trying to run her a broken leg. Two days later, they found another one dead. The chief of police was approached by the press and asked, what are we going to do about this woman? He said, well, we were thinking about making a range officer. <laughs> to hear that I think that's not a bad idea. Because in fact, although these guys are trying to make you believe that people in the gun violence move, prevention movement are seeking to take everybody's gun, it's not true. It's so far from the truth. It's true. What we're seeking to do is to interfere and block the illegal movement of guns to the street. I all, I don't, I would care less about your gun because you're not going to use it on anybody. So keep, keep as many as you want. What we're trying to do is to get, get keep the guns from going to people that are going to use them in violence. I'd just like to point out that uh, there are, one thing we haven't talked about is there's a lot of defense abuses of guns um, every day. Well, roughly there's estimates of uh, anywhere between 800,000 to 2 million uh, crimes are stopped every year with uh, armed citizens. Uh, every day, uh, I have stats here, 550 rapes, uh, 1,100 murders, and 5,200 violent crimes are prevented just by showing a gun. And less than 0.9% of these instances is a gun ever actually fired. So, uh, you know, they are, they are used a lot. It, and if we diminish guns, we'll see what we saw in other countries. We'll see a, a, a great increase in the amount of violence, and, you know, that'll take over our streets. Um, there are a lot of defense abuses. I got, I got a quick year on armed citizens. A 12 year, 12 year old girl shot, shoots an intruder in Oklahoma. A 15 year old boy defends his home against two burglars or an AR 15. My mother was here by a hero. Uh, she shot an intruder. And uh, we got a 14-year-old boy that shot and nearly killed an intruder in his Phoenix home. I mean, I, there's stories like this every day. I read them every month. Uh, there's a lot of defense abuses that don't get out there in the public. The media um, seems, seems to focus on gun shootings. They, they like to follow them all the way to the grave. It's very tear-jerking. And we see a lot of that. What we don't see a lot of is the uh, news about defense abuses. You're absolutely right. They do focus on those uh, those murders, the sensationalization of them, and uh, we have to fight against that. Um, and you do you don't hear about the defensive uses of it. But again, uh, responsible gun ownership I have no problem with. Uh, people who understand guns and know how to use them, that, that's fine with me. I, but but for me, I want to be able to distinguish between the beliefs who are in my charge to the handle of the law and people just walking around and walking up randomly on a situation with a gun. I don't trust that and I don't want that. Now, I understand, again, I understand a lot of the things that people are saying about their concern for the government and so forth, but for me, it's a real thing every day. And I want responsible ownership. We don't want illegal guns on our street and that's what we're fighting.
please speak to the role of gun manufacturers and gun retailers in shaping the debate and public policy on firearms? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat it? Can you repeat the question again, people? Sorry. The question is, could you please speak to the role that gun manufacturers and gun retailers are playing in shaping of this debate and the shaping of public policy on this issue at this time? They have every reason, they have every reason in the world to be totally cooperative with keeping guns out of the hand of criminals, simply because every time that a criminal uses a gun, there is some reflection back on the person who manufactured it or sold it or whatever. The National Shooting Sports Foundation has worked with uh, <clears throat> dealers and manufacturers for years to try to cut down on the illegal trafficking of guns. And incidentally, when I answered the question earlier, I think I misunderstood. I think the question originally was about straw purchases. Obviously, I'm against straw purchases. And uh, right now, you may not know this, but if anybody buys more than one handgun in a week's period, the BATFE will visit their house. You may not know this. And right now, because of a um, basically a presidential order that was passed uh, in four states in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, if you buy more than two uh, what a lot of people will call assault rifles within a week's time, again, uh, you, you will be visited by the BATF uh, and uh, you, you will be called to account for it. So multiple gun purchases basically in a lot of places just if they're happening, they're totally illegal. And obviously, yes, straw purchases are a major problem. And there have been a lot of laws and legislation passed against them, and uh, it, they really need to be enforced. Actually, it's not true that ATF will come visit you if you bought one in one hand. <coughs> they don't have the, per the people to do it, so they don't. And in fact, you're allowed legally to buy those guns, as many guns as you want in Pennsylvania. Yes. So why would they visit you when it's a legal issue? So that's a falseness. Anyhow, in fact, the gun manufacturers and the uh, gun lobby play a very large role when it comes to public policy. So we have here a survey that was done of citizens in this district, the uh, 7th District of Pennsylvania. And it found that 96%, that's more than 9 out of 10, residents of this district, voters in this district, favor universal background checks. Yes. Yes. The National Rifle Association and all these other organizations who are fronts for the gun industry are working overtime to keep universal background checks from happening. They play a very
say it again. We're, nobody is trying to take away the guns of law-abiding citizens. So, and so that the answer to that question is a law-abiding citizen with a gun could perhaps keep a crime from happening. They absolutely can keep a crime from happening, but it would be really helpful if they were properly trained. And if they're not properly trained, uh, they may not have the desired effect. But properly trained, uh, I have every reason to feel that a, any citizen should, if they pass whatever checks they have to, like for concealed carry, uh, you actually you have to be investigated so that you have the uh, right to uh, carry concealed. Uh, it's about a two-month process, and um, I truly believe that if people can pass the checks, that they should be allowed to carry concealed, and certainly they should be allowed to defend their homes in any way they can. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll just say it again. I, I think people do stop crimes every day, on the station, and, and I don't see a reason to put a limit on that of any kind. Uh, regardless of the, the type of rifle, uh, the so-called assault rifle, the AR-15, or the magazine capacity. Uh, you know, if you limit magazine capacity, uh, I'm just going to have to carry more magazines. It only takes a second to swap out a magazine. It's less than a second to swap out a magazine. It's a non-issue. You know, Adam Lander, by the way, um, was changing out magazines quite frequently. They, they found magazines scattered about there that had, still had 15 rounds in them. He was, he was changing them at will, quite frequently. So, to, you know, whether he had a 30 round or a 20 round or whatever he had, he wasn't empty them. He was, he was changing them out. And they were pistols. Well, we go into that. Well, I, I think uh, for, for me, as a mayor, I, I want to know who's carrying the gun and who's enforcing the law. And it's more than a notion to just intercede and jump into a crime whenever it happens. I don't want everybody coming down shooting. I've seen that. And I've turned the corner in our city with the police commissioners right here. And these guys having to shoot out on the street. God forbid if somebody runs out their door with another gun. We don't know who the bad guy is or who the good guy is. There should be some level of discrimination between that. I don't want to interfere with people having the right to protect their home. The people who know that people have a, a rifle or a gun in that home, many times are going to go down to the next home that they feel is unprotected. But I, I'm not going to interfere with that. When it comes to my city, I want to know who's got a gun. I want to know who's shooting. And I don't think we should just randomly walk up on a crime. And, and, and let me say this. Who's going to bear the responsibility if there's collateral damage involved in that if any citizen walks up and gets in there. Who's going to bear that responsibility? I think that we need to keep the responsibility for certain things in the hands of those people who are appropriately trained, bonded to do it, and where we can investigate it properly and not have people just running up on crime situations. I don't think that that will work, and I think you're going to ask for some big problems if you do that. Okay, let's go over here. There's a gentleman in green back here who's been had his hand up the entire night. Have we got a few guys in Okay, now you're up. And now, the gentleman in green, this better be a good question. Is that answer? I've got my expectations. I've got my expectations. So, if you want to hear this, ladies first. 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 You're on. This is a simple question. At the time that the Second Amendment was made, the arms consisted of what? Machetes, uh, muskets, but also bow and arrow, uh, yes, bow and arrow, uh, bayonets. Uh, so the arms were knives and pistols and rifles. So why didn't it say uh, to have a well-armed militia, there was a right to bear guns? It says arms, which is everything. And yesterday we saw on television a young lady defending with a, a cup of hot coffee. It did not say guns. Why not? We'll give them to David. I think this is David. Arms. 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 Arms.
when they see these people with guns. One of the things that happens in random crime, random crime is hard to police. I don't care who you are. And whether that gun is legal or illegal, if that shooting occurred in the heat of an argument or a discussion or in a robbery, you can't always know at what time the police can be there. But we got to stop these illegal guns from being trafficked and we've got to put some teeth into trafficking laws that are dumping and, 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 and increase. If you, if you commit a crime with a gun, the man, mandatory five years, in many cases, these people who are shooters are recycled. They go to jail for <laughs> 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 and You can't figure a way to keep them in jail. That, that's what we're asking for. Your guns is that you have at home, I don't want to touch them if we can figure out a way. You're the gun experts. Help us novices figure out a way to do this and do it right and keep these guns. That you should want to stop the trafficking because when we because I'm just saying this you, the, the gun owners should be working with us because the illegal people mar the reputation of gun owners across the country. We want to work with responsible people and, and this gun trafficking that has to that has to happen. Somebody has to do something about it. The, the straw purchases they were talking about that has to happen all across the country. And, and, and some of these, these illegal guns will stop being poured in the community. And, and needless to say, somebody said that was a racist comment. I want to tell you what the reality of it is. It ends up in poor black communities where we have to deal with it every day. However, as I said before, we still have our Sandy Hooks. That, that issue, that statistic you had about uh, more guns, less crime, if that were true, Sandy Hook wouldn't have happened. Oh, no. I got it done That's all I'm saying. It's a poor point of comparison, that's what I'm saying. All right. Brian would also like to answer Yeah, there are practical things that can be done, and that's what you were asking about. There's, we can, and the important point is to limit the, the movement of guns to the street. Gun dealers, most gun dealers will not sell them a straw buyer, but there are enough of them to do it, so that's why Philadelphia police collect 4,600 illegal guns a year. Prime guns. So what we can do is we can limit the number of guns that can be purchased at one time, taking away the economic incentive, because traffickers have to make money, they have to buy and sell in bulk. So if we limit the number of guns that can be purchased at one time, we stop that, and we've done it in other in states where it's worked. We can bring about lost or stolen reporting requirements. Another way to, to make liability to put liability on uh, straw buyers and traffickers. And we can, as you guys called us, we seek to get gun dealers to adopt it. A code of conduct developed by Mayors Against Illegal Guns. It's ten simple business practices that will eliminate. The, their ability to sell guns to straw purchasers. Very practical program. I'd like to uh, quickly mention here, uh, we're talking about these uh, reasonable gun controls. So that, you know, and, I mean, I feel your pain. I, I know I know what you face in there, and, and, and we all face this. I got family that's out there traveling these streets every day like everybody else. Uh, we all face this, uh, the chance of, of uh, facing someone with a, with a firearm and ill and ill and tank. The fact is, you know, the way the government's coming at this is uh, they're going after AR-15s. Rifles are used in 3% of the, of the murders, uh, homicides, rifles are only used 3% of the time. And AR-15s are a subset of that. So, you know, it seemed unreasonable to me that the first thing they're reaching for is the AR-15 and magazine capacity when that's not the issue that we face out of. <coughs> the issue is violence and people with ill intent, and most of the time you're using handguns. So, you know, we need to, uh, we, we do, it's, it's a concern for everybody, gun owners alike. I, I dread the day that I ever have to pull a gun and use it. I, I, I dread that and hope that never happens to, you know, everybody feels the same way, I'm sure. Um, so it is a problem, violence is a problem, but again, I'll say, we, 
violence has had in, in the last 20 years. So that's a good sign. We're going in the right direction. We need to continue to do it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. I'm afraid it's going to be our final question. I'm really good. Wow. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, First, I just want to say, you know, we all have sympathy for anybody that's lost somebody to violence. Uh, it's terrible under any situation. I hate to see a mother's grief be exploited uh, for an agenda that is going to further separate the citizens from the government as far as the amount of power they have. But my question is, uh, is for the mayor, and I'd also like David John to respond to this. Um, first, there is one statistic that hasn't been mentioned here, a conservative estimate is 200 million people have been murdered by their own governments in the last century. Okay, so think about that when you're deciding who should have the most power. Um, now in Chester, Chester is one of the most dangerous places of the United States, ranking in the worst 7% of U.S. communities for crime. 13 times the national average for murder, three times for rape, I'm getting to a question, don't worry. 4.6 times the national average for robbery, seven times for assault. Overall, Chester ranks 644 out of 646 communities for crime in Pennsylvania. Put another way, 99.7% of Pennsylvania is safer than Chester. Now, considering this dismal, dismal performance of the of the, of the government of Chester to protect the citizens. I have a question. All right, Considering this dismal record, what would possibly give you the moral authority to suggest to any other person how they should defend themselves when obviously the government of Chester is doing a terrible job? Just like you had the right stand up there and spout off those statistics, I had a right to say what I need to say to protect my citizens. That's what gives me the right to stand here. Uh, secondly, I haven't been the mayor all of my life. I grew up in Chester, and I understand the trauma and, and the violence that goes on there. And what I'm saying is that I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. Uh, you didn't say that Chester moved last year from number three to 19. That's progress. You didn't say that all the crime in Chester, all the indexes went down except for homicides. And, and, and there's an explanation for that, but I'm not going to get all into that. You, you didn't say that we've had more movement in the communities in Chester of okay. us centered around violence, but not to get a gun, but how can they make their communities a lot safer? You didn't say how many citizens have stepped up since we've been in office since last year and that have come and even brought people to the office, to the city hall to surrender these criminals who have been shooting up the community. You can talk about that, but if you want to do something about it, you get down and come down Chester and help me out.
finish up now. 90 seconds each for these guys, and you can have one last listen to them. Uh, please stay afterwards. Uh, talk to each other. All your guests, feel free to hang around for a bit. Uh, Tom. Hello? Yeah. The 1980s were much worse than today in terms of overall violent crime, including gun homicide, but they were much better in terms of random mass shootings. The difference wasn't that the 1980s had tougher control on so-called assault weapons. No assault weapons law existed in the U.S. until California passed the ban in 1989 and Connecticut followed in 1993. There are magazines holding more than 10 rounds something new. They were invented decades ago and have long been standard for many handguns and modern sporting rifles. With over 20,000 gun laws in the U.S., gun control today are far stricter than at the time when active shooters were rare. So what can account for the increase in these mass murders? Cable TV in the 1990s and the internet today greatly magnify the instant celebrity that a mass killer can achieve. A second explanation is the deinstitutionalization of the violently mentally ill. A 2000 New York Times study of 100 rampage murderers found that 47 were mentally ill. In the mid-1960s, many of the killings would have been prevented because the severely mentally ill would have been confined in state institutions. But today, mental health treatment has been decimated. According to a study released in July by the Treatment Advocacy Center, the number of state hospital beds in America per capita has plummeted to 1850 levels. Finally, many of these attacks today take place in gun-free zones, in pretend gun-free zones, such as movie theaters and shopping malls. Gun-free zones are only real if they are created by metal detectors backed up by armed security guards. Pretend gun-free zones where law-abiding adults are disarmed and criminals can carry with impunity are magnets for evildoers who know that they will be able to murder at will. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. to say pretty much what I said before, which is there are ways to reduce gun violence. They've been shown, they've been shown in other countries, they've been shown in other states. New Jersey has a much lower rate of gun violence in Pennsylvania. It's partly because, or largely because, there's a much stronger set of gun laws. And, and so there are things that can be done. What doesn't work and doesn't help is the fear-driven refusal to believe anything other than what people think. And as a matter of fact, we can show that gun laws work. It's been shown many times, and there's every reason to work together to try to achieve. I believe we can show that gun laws don't work. And we've seen it over and over again. Um, where guns are banned, violent crime soars, and uh, that's, that's the reality of it. I, I personally, as far as gun-free zones go, if you create a gun-free zone, I believe you have a responsibility to defend the people that enter it. Uh, we failed at that miserably in, in many cases. Personally, I avoid gun-free zones. Um, when the president got together to look at the issue of Sandy Hook, I had hoped for the, them to come out with a good program to look at how we can secure our schools and, and protect our children. Instead, they use it as, a, as a, a, an, you know, an excuse to go after AR-15, again, a subset of rifles, 3% of the guns are, are, that they're using. Um, you know, we could do a better lockdown on schools. We could uh, use uh, hallway containment to limit the travel of bad actors in schools. Those are the reasonable things that we can do. Um, so I, I'd like to see us uh, address the issue of, um, you know, how we can secure ourselves. You know, these gun-free zones are an issue, they're definitely an issue. And I just imagine the guy uh, in Aurora, Colorado, uh, went out of his way to find a, a gun-free theater. He passed theaters where they had larger capacity and, and uh, allowed firearms and he avoided them, rather by intent or by accident. That's the result. Leave it at that.
again, I uh, would like to reiterate uh, our position with mayor against illegal guns, uh, a background check uh, system. Uh, we, we've asked for some uh, adjustment in the HIPAA law to, for us to be able to, to flag those people who may have a, a problems that prevent them from owning a gun at that time. Uh, we're asking for, again, responsible legislation if that exists and, and, and if that's possible. And, and, and in listening to the people in this room, I think it is is solely possible. I think if the fight can can the enthusiasm to solve the problem is as much as the enthusiasm to separate the ideas and the strength on one side versus the other. I think if we put that energy together, we can get people down Washington straightened out. But <laughs> the other thing is the, again the straw purchases. Um, the, and, and the uh, secure schools, and, 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 and I'm liking hearing ideas about the schools, because that's what we need to focus on. We forgot about those kids up there who died in that school, and, and in other places like that school around the country. Um, again, I'm not putting the blame for my situation in the city of Chester on the responsible gun owners. I'm asking for your help in us helping to solve this problem. So I hope I, I made that point loud and clear. I speak not for myself, I speak for the citizens of Chester. And Chester is part of Delaware County and we want to take our rightful place and make it better in spite of those dismal statistics that I heard that are not up to date. So please add the things in that I said about Chester and we're going to try to progress and move forward. Whether the government changes any laws or not, we're going to do what we have to do down in Chester. 